A crisis averted, a buffer zone is created to separate Syrian regime forces and rebels in Idlib. Is this a step towards peace or delaying the inevitable onslaught? I'm Imran Garda and today's newsmaker is the future of Idlib. They may be on opposite sides of the Syrian war, but Russia and Turkey have come together and potentially saved thousands of lives in Idlib, at least for now. In a marathon meeting, Vladimir Putin and Recep Tayyip Erdogan agreed to a demilitarized buffer zone in the province. It would separate regime and opposition forces and would be enforced by Turkish and Russian soldiers. While some hope the deal will help broker peace, others fear it's simply delaying a bloodbath in Syria's last rebel-held stronghold. For more on this, here's Haider Abbasi. The people of Idlib are safe, for now. For weeks they've been preparing for the worst, a military assault by the Syrian regime and its ally Russia. But diplomacy has stopped more killing. Turkey has offered an alternative, a demilitarized zone in the northwestern province. Gerek üçüncü tarafların provokasyonlarını, gerekse varılan mutabakata yönelik ihlallerin tespitini ve engellenmesini de yine birlikte temin edeceğiz. Bu amaçla Rusya ve Türkiye belirlenecek silahsızlandırılmış bölge sınırlarının iki tarafında koordineli devriye faaliyeti gösterecektir. The buffer zone will be 15 to 20 kilometers wide and will run along Idlib's border. Both parties say the zone will be ready by October the 15th. Under the deal, heavy weapons such as tanks and any rebel fighters considered radical must be removed from the demilitarized zone. Idlib is the last province in Syria that's controlled by the opposition and terrorist groups. The Syrian regime, together with Russia and Iran, have recaptured almost all other territory. And many civilians forced out from those regions now live in Idlib. Bashar al-Assad has been under intense international pressure to avoid an attack on the region. Ankara says any assault on Idlib will cause a humanitarian disaster. And the UN estimates an offensive would displace 800,000 people who would likely flee to Turkey. Turkey is already home to around 3 million Syrian refugees. Russia's President Vladimir Putin says the deal on Idlib could help end a war that began seven years ago. По нашему общему мнению, практическая реализация спланированных шагов даст дополнительный импульс процессу политического регулирования сирийского конфликта, позволит активизировать работу на Женевской платформе и будет способствовать. Turkey's military already has around a dozen observation posts in Idlib. Those will now be reinforced. Turkey and Russia's agreement brought relief on the ground in Idlib, but many people in the province say they don't trust the regime and will continue to support the opposition. So how effective will this deal be? And would it really deter Syria's government from recapturing the last opposition base in the country? Haider Abbasi, The Newsmakers. To discuss this, with me here in the studio is Yahya Laridi. He's a spokesman for the Opposition Syrian Negotiations Commission. In Idlib, we have Rania Kassar. She's the Chief Executive Volunteer Officer at the Syrian Humanitarian Institute for National Empowerment. In Washington, D.C., we have Nicholas Harris. He's a fellow at the Center for a New American Security. And completing our panel from Stuttgart is Kevok Almasian. He's the founder of Syriana Analysis, an independent online Syrian news channel. Thank you all for joining us. Let me start with you, Rania, because it's not often that we actually get to speak to somebody within Idlib. Does it feel like there's a cessation, like there's calm? What does it feel like? Yes, it does feel like that. Uh, we are feeling a little bit less stressed we know that the shelling is no longer going to happen. We are very grateful to the government of Turkey. We are very grateful to the Turkish people. If it wasn't for Turkey, um, probably the regime and the Russians would have shelled us by now. Um, however, we are still very weary about the future of what is going to happen to us. For example, what's going to happen to the millions of people who were forcibly exiled from their cities, from their homes? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to Idlib in general? 
Um, we're still trying to absorb this new agreement. It is a little bit vague for us. We don't know about the small details that would affect us on ground. And I want to say uh, on behalf of millions of people, I don't think we will agree to seeing Russian forces in our streets. Right. Okay. And that's, that's a big fear that a lot of people there have. Yeah, yeah. Do you, in general, support the Russian-Turkish deal? Well, first of all, we felt that, uh, that uh, Idlib avoided uh, 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 a strike, definitely. It was planned. And uh, the uh, deal, first of all, when it was signed in, uh, in Astana, it was signed, but it was not really uh, certain. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Iran at that time promised the, uh, its partners that that deal would not go through. The good thing about it is that it, uh, it went through with that summit in uh, Sochi between uh, President Erdogan and uh, Putin. Mm -hmm. And I believe the uh, millions uh, of uh, civilians in Idlib were saved. That's for the time being, because we were not uh, used mm -hmm. to uh, Russians not breaking uh, those de-escalation areas. It happened in Al Ghuta, in the south in homes, in uh, other areas. Uh, however, we understand that uh, uh, there, there were many reasons for this uh, deal uh, to be uh, struck, to be signed. Uh, the people of Idlib, the civilians, took into, to the streets in hundreds of thousands. And Rania will attest to this fact. And she was there, we heard her voice. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, another thing, it, uh, the relationship, special relationship between Turkey and Russia. Uh, actually, it was, uh, it was something very important for not carrying out that attack that was planned by the Iranians, uh, the regime. Right. Kevork Almasian, is this the way this is going to turn out? Is this a sign of things to come? Diplomacy among the bigger powers sorting out this war? Actually, diplomacy is the continuation of a war, but with different means. In this regard, the uh, battle of Idlib is still going on, but with diplomatic tools. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this deal is a not bad deal uh, for all the sides. It could turn into a win-win solution, uh, not only for the Syrians uh, from different uh, uh, from different spectrum of the Syrian society, but also for the uh, regional and international powers in Idlib. Because this uh, hotspot uh, includes uh, tens of thousands of, uh, let's say, uh, hardcore militants. Mm -hmm. So the Syrian interest is to eliminate eliminate these uh, militants. So this deal could start by disarming the hardcore militants uh, in, in, in Idlib, uh, especially in the first uh, the 20 kilometers, which would be a buffer zone. And also, uh, it would uh, try to... Uh, um, the, the bond that it exists between uh, to, between Jabhat al-Nusra al -Nusra Front and other smaller groups would be broken by Turkey. So if this, uh, if Turkey implemented this deal, in my opinion, this could lead into positive consequences and we could spare a lot of bloodshed, not only uh, among uh, the uh, Syrian army, uh, let's say, officers, but also uh, victims that could fell in this uh, a very dirty war in Idlib, which right. include, in my opinion, at least 70,000 fighters uh, who are holding the civilians as human shield in Idlib. Okay, and we're going to get a little bit more into that about the proportions of who's extreme and who's not. This is something I want you guys to tackle for me. But when we look at a group um, Nicholas, like Jabhat al-Nusra um, and all its, its various incarnations and the different names, who's going to disarm them? How are they going to be easily convinced to, to step out of the theater of war and, and go to the other side? Is it, is it that easy to do? Well, I would start by saying that the view here from Washington is that an agreement that's made between Russia and Turkey is a positive step forward. Uh, fundamentally, Turkey and Russia are the foreign actors, I would say, that have most interested and most influential on the dynamics on the ground in northwestern Syria. For the new uh, team that tr the Trump administration has established for Syria policy, this was step one. Step one was to provide a significant amount of diplomatic cover 
for Turkey to be able to engage uh, in strength with Russia. And hopefully this uh, deal will save tens of thousands of lives and prevent hundreds of thousands of people from being displaced. But now we are at stage two, and the open question is what happens next? Uh, Russia, the United States, and Turkey are all in agreement that uh, northwest Syria, in particular Idlib, has become a safe haven for al-Qaeda and similar organizations. And in fact, uh, some, of these organ some of these groups are woven into the local civil society mm -hmm. in that region, and that's going to make it very difficult. It's going to take time. It's going to take the investment of uh, Turkish military power. And I would say that one of the consensus that seems to be forming here in Washington is, is there a pathway for the Syrian opposition to take an active role to diminish the influence of groups like Horas ad or the Turkestan Islamic Party or Hayat Tahrir Shem okay. and others okay. so let me and get a, prevent massive certainly. bloodshed. Okay, let me get a response from Rania here. Rania, when Nicholas said that Idlib is a safe haven for Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda-linked groups, and we also had you know, Kevok saying there are about 70,000 militants, in his opinion, using civilians as human shields, you were shaking your head in disagreement. Tell me why because it's not true. I'm here on ground. I've been here for eight months straight ahead. I have not left Syria. And it is not true that these people are using us as, uh, as human shields. Uh, yes, they have some power here, but it's not, it's not very strong. And it, it is something that can be tackled. It is something that can be tackled internally with the help and assistance of the Turkish government. We're not sure how exactly this is going to happen. We know that this is something that should happen. It would have been amazing and great if the United States of America, my country, would have assisted in something like this because they have the intel, they have the information, they know the how-to. But unfortunately, we only have Turkey to help us with something like this. They are not using us as human shields, but what is happening is that they are in the same household. In the same household, you have someone from Ahrar, someone from HTS, mm -hmm. someone from Huras ad -Din, and someone from the FSA, Free Syrian Army. So how are you going to separate those family members from each other and identify which one is the one that is going to be the most brutal or the, right. the, the person that suffers with PTSD? Who should we worry from? We're not exactly sure how this should be tackled. This should have been a matter that should have planned in advance uh, by several people outside of Syria. And unfortunately, unfortunately, and I want to say this again, it is only Turkey that is helping us with this. Right. Okay. Kevok, let me put it to you this way. If the vast majority of the rebels were extremists, do you think Putin would have agreed to this deal in terms of separating the extremists from the moderates? Isn't there an implicit and explicit acceptance that the vast majority of the rebels happen to be moderate rebels or acceptable non-extremist rebels if Putin even agreed to this in the first place with President Erdogan? Let's put things into a uh, proper context. First of all, your guest from Idlib, she defined the uh, human shield in the best form possible when she said the militants of Hayat Tahrir sham or Ahrab sham or the Turkestan party, they live among the civilians. This is, this is the definition of uh, human shield, because if the Syrian army targets these terrorists, that means victims will, be, uh, will, will happen in Idlib. However, in regards to your question, I believe this was a realistic and rational deal, regardless if the militants were are mostly radicals or not, because Russia uh, wanted to contain also a Western strikes against Syria, because the Western governments, uh, their, their mm -hmm. warships are in the Mediterranean and they are planning for um, strikes. So in my opinion, Russia delayed the liberation of uh, Idlib and it, it turned into a process uh, in coordination with the Turkish side, both sides could dismantle the uh, hardcore militants there, especially Hayat Tahrir Sham, the Islamic Turkestan army, mm -hmm. uh, the Uzbekis, the Tajikis, the Uyghurs, all these multinational terrorists, there should be an international deal in this regard. This is not our business that uh, thousands of uh, fighters came to our country to fight for uh, uh, against the Syrian government. So in this regard, Russia was realistic, and in my opinion, Turkey also... Uh, 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 I mean, Turkey also did the good thing in this uh, at this time, and in my opinion, the the signature that has been put 
by not only by the presidents but also between the ministers of defense between both sides means this should be forced and implemented underground and it if if it happened this serves the interest of most Syrians because it will eliminate the hardcore militants it will uh, uh, spare a bloodshed between all sides and at the end uh, the highways between Aleppo to Latakia and Aleppo to Idlib and Hama will be open and people will be relieved so okay. I don't understand why people are worried from okay. from this but, but, I, but I, perhaps, I stress Kevok, that Turkey should implement the sir, agreement but perhaps Kevok we have a track record of seven years of the Syrian regime and its Russian allies bombing quite indiscriminately. It wasn't always the case of, no, no, we only bomb the most extreme. You have to, you know, almost have your uh, Al-Qaeda identity card for us to bomb you. That didn't happen in Aleppo. It didn't happen elsewhere in the country. So they have a reason to be afraid, don't they? I am, I am from Aleppo, sir. I am from Aleppo, and I know what happened in my city and how it was invaded by uh, different factions in, in, in mid-2012. And, and we were very happy that the Syrian government liberated the eastern neighborhoods of Aleppo. I'm sure that you are yourself, you won't be happy if uh, Al-Nusra Front occupied half your city and they are shelling with thousands of uh, hell cannons on your heads and your beloved ones are dying on every, uh, every day, 13,000 people dead in, in uh, four years and nobody uttered the word about them so uh, this is something that you also have to be objective about it that the people are not only against the government there are many people with the government and they want to uh, feel relieved and to be liberated from these hardcore islamists and and remember that also hundreds of thousands of people also fled fled from right. uh, from okay. to other and uh, provinces and want to go back okay. so to that's, their city. That's the other side of this narrative here. The side that says that Bashar al-Assad, no matter how brutal, is fighting a just war. Yeah, yeah, tackle that for me. Well, let's take the whole issue to its roots. When things started in Syria in 2011, the best excuse, the best pretext to justify killing those people who said no, we want a change of the government, we want uh, freedom, we want to, uh, to live as normal human beings, not under suppression, not under dictatorship. Those were labeled automatically terrorists. When Nusra was not there, when Daesh was not there, when no terrorism was not there. And the best prescription for al-Assad to wage this war against the people who revolted against him is to use the term terrorism, which was historically used by Israel to label the Palestinians. Now, they found this is the best way. There were in jails certain people, extremists, and they were released after a few months of the uprise in Syria. And those turned into heads of s several groups. Now, foreigners also played this game. The leaders of these people who are now being labeled terrorists came from outside, from different countries. Those people should, uh, the whole world effort should be there in order to throw those leaders of these groups back to their countries. Certainly, but you have Hayat Tahrir Sham, 10,000 fighters, they're there, it's a reality. Okay. Even if Assad screwed the whole thing up, you know, mm. from the very beginning, he slaughtered innocents, he called legitimate protesters uh, mm -hmm. terrorists. However we got to this point now, you have some terrible groups operating exactly. on the ground right now. Rania, who's going who's to do the dirty work to dismantle those Okay, people? Rania said something quite essential there. You, had, you would have a, a family of mm -hmm. four young men. One of them belongs to this group, the other one to a second, third, fourth. Now, this is, uh, you are uh, saying that this is so, so important. Now, just give the, uh, now those people a chance sometime mm -hmm. to tell them that their original demand for a change, for feeling free, for living their lives, for leading their lives mm -hmm. without dictatorship, without brutality of the regime, without submissiveness of their lives, I think they would come to reason and their, the, the leaders would be thrown away and those would come back to normal life. They are not fond of fighting. The whole thing started in Syria quite peaceful mm -hmm. and the government itself the Bashar Assad government itself attested to this fact. They said right. it started peacefully. But, okay, so as we move forward beyond 2011 and 2012 and fast forward right to where we are now, is this possibly a first step to seeing how peace can be implemented not only in Idlib but elsewhere in the country? 
or is it rather the calm before the storm, the calm before an eventual capitulation of Idlib to Assad and the Russians? Well, one thing, there are certain uh, uh, UN uh, Security Council resolutions. There is the Geneva Communique and there is the 2254. They talk, first of all, about ceasefire. The Russians took selectively that particular point and took it to Astana and started de-escalation areas where they breached them. Idlib was the gathering place for all those people who were under siege for a long time, who were bombarded, then they were thrown into Idlib. You would have now this huge number. Now, this needs a settlement. Those people could lead their own lives. They don't want the dictatorship to be back again right. into their lives. Now, the effort of the international community should be there and Syrian people should be given a chance to implement these UN Security Council resolutions by getting rid of the dictatorship that killed a million people and jailed till now almost half a million, destroyed half of the country. We are now just focusing on one particular thing that was used continuously as a pretext by Russia, by the regime, by the Iranian militias, by, the Ira by Iran. The extremists. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Let me go to Nicholas Harris, and I want to quote the U.S. Defense Secretary to you, Jim Mattis. He said, Idlib is one of the most complex problems in a complex theater of conflict right now, so I'm quite sure it's not all sorted. When he says that, is that him showing a cool, rational head here that we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves, or is it an indication maybe the U.S. is a little jealous that the Russians and and, and Turkey are sorting this out without the U.S. at the table? Well, I would start by saying that the United States has had a significant role behind the scenes. And you see that with Secretary of State Pompeo's uh, new focus on the Syrian conflict. The fact that the Trump administration has made it very clear that it will not withdraw U.S. forces from eastern and northern Syria until the Geneva process is well advanced, which means a pathway towards transition in Assad from power and Iranian forces and their proxy militias have been withdrawn before U.S. forces. But returning to Idlib, I think we should make it very clear. There are red, blaring lights within the U.S. government right now about the threat from extremist organizations inside greater Idlib. And that is a common denominator that the U.S. shares with Russia. And based mm -hmm. on the statements of the Turkish government and President Erdogan's uh, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, a a common denominator with Turkey. I think what we can say, uh, based on the discussion to this point, is that there's some agreement that the situation in Greater Idlib uh, can only be solved by the Syrians on the ground. And the Syrian opposition now has to face a terrible truth, and it's a devil's dilemma, as highlighted by Rania, which is number of these extremist organizations have woven themselves into the social fabric of the local population in Idlib. And all of these groups, Turkestan Islamic Party, Huras al-Din, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, and others, uh, have foreign fighters, right. yes, but they also have a significant component that are Syrian. And it's up to the Syrian opposition, with the support of Turkey and potentially the United States, to take out this challenge. Okay. Let me bring in uh, Professor Ahmed Qasim Han. He joins us now in studio, uh, Professor of International Relations at Qadir House University. Thanks for joining us. Firstly, very simply, what's in it for Turkey? Why is this so important to strike this deal with the Russians for okay. Idlib? First, thank you very much for having me. Uh, why is it so important? It is clear uh, that uh, this is very, very important for Turkey because, first of all, of the imminent refugee crisis that such an operation in Idlib as originally was, we understand, intended by the Russians and the Syrian uh, regime has, uh, has contemplated and uh, tried to execute. Uh, that would have created a massive influx of re refugees in millions, uh, again, towards Turkey. Mm -hmm. Turkey already hosts three and a half million refugees. And that means that uh, an addition of a million would matter a lot. It's not a marginal addition to what is uh, in Turkey or uh, the burden that Turkey is already sharing. Uh, plus, this is influx of refugees would uh, probably uh, be accompanied by the infiltration of some of the jihadists uh, within uh, Idlib to uh, join themselves in the mass 
and, uh, and and make their way to, to yeah mm -hmm. make their way to Turkey and they probably would not sit still once right. they are in Turkey. So yeah. we'll create a uh, security risk for Turkey. We'll create a security risk for the general international security architecture too. So part of the deal is that there's this sorting out that will take place. Now you have millions of civilians, innocent Syrians who just want to live their lives. You have nationalists, you have Islamists who don't want to impose horrible, you know, um, uh, a more hardcore version of life on anybody else. Mm -hmm. But then among them, you have these extremists, like uh, the former Jabhat al-Nusra. Is it Turkey's job now to try and take this tangled web and pick apart the bad threads and try and sort this out? And if so, how on earth are they going to do that? Well, that is the bad news in the good news, <laughs> I have to say, uh, because the answer to your question seems to be uh, a yes. It is now Turkey's job mainly to do uh, what you have uh, described. Uh, and uh, it is a very hard job, if not mission impossible. And that is, uh, I have to say, that the source of uh, concern uh, that people who are approaching mm -hmm. this deal, which in itself is a great success, mm -hmm. uh, with suspicion. Uh, why do I call this uh, in itself a great success? Because I think that the best that could be achieved at this point in time, given the circumstances surrounding the Idlib issue, uh, I would say that this is the best possible world mm -hmm. uh, that could be created uh, within the frame of, of an agreement right. between Russia and Turkey. However, is it an absolutely good uh, and easy to implement agreement? No, it is not. Uh, is it an agreement that necessitates cooperation from some of those groups mm -hmm. uh, who has, to say the least, proven not to be very easy right. to cooperate with in the past? Yes, it does. And uh, without their cooperation, it will be a hard bargain to, 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 to realize. Uh, and we really do not know what the reaction of Russia, Iran, and the Syrian regime would be in case that Turkey uh, is not able to fully satisfy whatever they need. Yeah. And that is also one gap in this agreement. We do not know what are the key success factors. Yeah, all what, we have is what a deadline. Should, yeah. yeah, what should be attained and what should be considered right. a success. Yeah, so in we've this got case. October 15th as, yeah. a, as a date for this demilitarized area of 15 to 20 kilometers yeah. uh, deep into, into Idlib to try and create this buffer zone, demilitarized zone. Rania, after all these years, as someone who's in Idlib right now with all the trouble that's happening and the relative calm right now and everybody trying to sort this out, Turkey and Russia making their move, let me ask you, who do you trust? Is there anyone you trust? I trust God. I trust God and the Syrian people. I trust the willingness of the people to die for the sake of their dignity. I trust Turkey because they are close to us and they have always wanted us well. But before I answer your very important question, I want to uh, reply to Mr. Almasin. Mr. Almasin, I'm not trying here to personalize the conversation and take it down to a lower level. Uh, because this is a very important conversation. But for, the, for God's sake, what are you doing in Stuttgart if the regime is so good? If the regime had recovered Aleppo for you, why have you left Aleppo? That's number one. Number two, have you not noticed, have you not heard, have you not seen about the people who have been reconciled and have gotten killed in Aleppo? We're here on ground, you're in Stuttgart. We know what the regime is doing. Have you not noticed the complete deletion of our Syrian heritage by the Russian forces who have entered Aleppo? Have you not seen what the Iranians are doing to us as far as religion is concerned? Have you not seen the continuous arrests, human arrests for no reason? It is still going on. And sir, why, why in God's sake, have you not seen the number, the huge influx of people that have left Aleppo after the reoccupation of Aleppo? Um, as far as who do I trust? And I don't want him to reply. 
I'm not going to listen to an answer from someone who supports a killer. I'm sorry. And I, I, I no, reiterate, no, if, I do not you want believe, him. I do not want you to reply. If you believe in democracy as you claim, if you believe in freedom of expression as you claim, if you believe that the people should have their opinion, then you have to respect the other opinion and listen to them, as I as I am if doing I, to you I respectfully. Want, if I, if I, I want to respect an opinion, I will the answer, respect the opinion. But, but if I want to respect an opinion, okay. I will respect so, the Rania, opinion of someone who does not support shall, a killer. Okay, so Rania, here we go. Kevok, Kevok, go ahead. And Respond. It's obvious. Respond. I, I've been following your work in Idlib, and I know what you do in Idlib. I'm, I'm also monitoring the situation there. And answering to your question, I'm in Stuttgart because your beloved uh, freedom fighters in, in, in Aleppo in 2012, they kidnapped my brother, they sniped me twice, they destroyed my father's shops. These people who you call the Free Syrian Army, they destroyed our everything in Aleppo. That's why the people that escaped because, from that Aleppo, because, because were they were afraid. Those, is, that, those is it democratic because, is it, is it because in, we're participating uh, in the killings of innocent people, me. sir? Of course. I, of course, I your own people you, from your neighborhood so are I not asked, going to I let you stay alive if I you are asked, participating okay, in their Rania. killings. Okay, Kevok, to, uh, Rania's claim, to me. Rania says she used the term Shabiha. Respond to that. I've got to <laughs> wrap very soon. She used the term Shabiha, collaborator with the regime. Yeah. Go ahead, respond, sir, and that will be the final word because we are out of time. Go ahead, Kevok. The people, the people, the people who kidnapped my brother and tried to kill me, they were for the, from the Free Syrian Army in Hevetan area, and she knows very well in 2012 who were occupying that area. So trying to distort the reality in Aleppo is not in your interest, uh, lady. And I know what you're doing in Idlib. You were, your people were, call, were calling for drinking blood of the Nusairis, quote unquote, meaning the Alawites in, in Idlib a few days ago. They were calling for extermination of the minorities. You were calling, you were saying that, that you want Islam, you want Islam and Sharia, and that uh, Prophet Muhammad is your perfect um, model in, 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 in Idlib. Oh, this is not a definition of even democracy so. in, uh, in Idlib so, that you are trying so. to promote. If the people, your videos if the are on the people internet, are trying all to the protect themselves through their religion, your religion, then that is their the right to do. What you are calling for in, in Idlib, you are not calling for democracy we and can human rights. Forever and ever. Rania, are calling for final, democracy. Rania, final Thank 20 seconds, for please. Rania, final, you, final 20 seconds, please. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the last 20 seconds. Even though the people here in Syria are calling for their religion, it is because they feel they're feeling cornered. And what do people, human beings, do when they feel that they're going to die? Number one, they will go back to their God, to their creator. They will call out for their freedom. They will try to save their souls. Number two, everybody that I saw in the streets in Marit and Oman and in all of Idlib, nobody was calling for a Sharia law. Nobody was calling for an Islamic rule. We want democracy. We want freedom. What we want is for people like you. That's a huge big People lie. like you. It's my turn to speak, sir. What we want is for people like you who claim to be honorable Syrians to find out the truth and stand on the right side. Okay. It is a shame, sir, that someone who claims to be Syrian agrees to the killings of more Syrians. Try okay. not to come back to our country, Mr. Okay. Rania, Kevok, Nicholas, <laughs> Ahmed Qasim Khan, and Yahya Laridi. I've got a wrap, I've got a, I've got a button this because I have to move on. But I thank you all for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Still to come on the program, France bans the use of mobile phones in schools. But could they actually be a good tool for learning? And the Maori language is making a comeback in New Zealand. We ask, what's behind the revival? From smartphones to tablets, it seems like everyone has one these days, including kids. But are they a help or a hindrance? Well, in France, students under the age of 15 are no longer allowed to use their phones during the school day. That means no browsing the web or checking social media feeds. But not everyone's on board. Some argue that phones are actually a valuable teaching resource. So are they a good tool for learning or too much of a distraction? Well, to discuss that, joining me on set, we have Luciano Meloni. He's an Italian teacher at the Liceo Italiano School in Istanbul. And with him is Duru Aiguven, who's a student at the same school. And completing our panel is Richard Murphy. He's an assistant professor at the Department of Economics at the University of Texas in Austin, Thanks, all of you, for joining us. Richard Murphy, let, let me begin with you. Do you support what the French are doing? Put those phones away. We're in school. Let's, let's not 
have these kids go down that rabbit hole of distraction? Well, uh, we did research in the UK that was looking at what happened when schools banned mobile phones. And that we found that after schools that banned mobile phones, the test scores of kids in those schools improved more than in schools that didn't ban phone use. And what's interesting is these gains in test scores, and these test scores were important scores. These were scores that happened at the end of high school, so they're important for where kids go to university. These gains were mostly driven by students at the low end of the ability distribution. Mm -hmm. Kids at the top, kids who were doing fine before, were doing fine after the ban. But we really saw gains in student test scores amongst those that um, were near the bottom of the test score distribution. Right. So, Luciano, I understand that in your school, you allow them to use their phones? They are allowed to use their phones, yes. How are they allowed to use their phones? Can I just be WhatsApping my friends if I'm in class? They shouldn't. Right. But maybe some of them can use it mm -hmm. yeah, during the lessons. But the thing is, we have to understand how to use it. How to use a phone, where to use a phone, when to use a phone. Mm -hmm. The thing is, they have to learn how, how to um, be prepared to keep the phone away when it's time or to use it when I ask them to use it. Mm -hmm. I and my colleagues sit in meetings and get distracted yeah. and sometimes end up browsing and some of them check their Facebook and things. So if we who have not been brought up with this stuff still struggle sometimes in the workday in meetings to you know, keep our concentration, keep fully engaged, how are kids going to be able to do that? The thing is, if you want to do a classic lesson, like a, you want a traditional lesson, mm -hmm. you have to ask them to put them away. And we have sort of box, right. and they put it in a box, for instance. But if you don't, then you have to be prepared <laughs> to see them using it. <laughs> right. Uh, Duru, do you use your phone mm -hmm. in the classroom? No, I actually close my phone during lessons because yeah. my previous school was a, a very strict school. Right. So we had to give our phones away at the beginning of... Uh, the lessons and we took them at the end of the school. Mm -hmm. So I'm used to that. But um, even if I uh, didn't close my phone, I would just listen to the lesson because it's uh, what I'm used uh, to doing. Would you multitask? Would you be maybe browsing or chatting while engaged in the lesson? Uh, no, I don't think that I'd be able to right. do uh, multitasking while right. listening to the lesson. But we also use our phones um, with our teachers uh, when they tell us to check something on the phone or it's just easier to, for example, if we just don't understand right. an Italian word, we can just check it up and mm. it wouldn't uh, interrupt the lesson and we can just li continue listening. Richard, from what you've heard in the past few mm -hmm. minutes, does any of that convince you that you can find this happy medium? It's all about creating a culture where you're playing fair, I guess. You're not overly reprimanding the kids for using their phones, and they're trying to make it as useful as possible when they do use them. Is that fair? Yeah, that seems very fair. Th that seemed like an ideal use of phones in school. So what our research was looking at was schools that didn't have any kind of rules regarding phone right. use. And the introduction of some kind of structure around phone use improved kids' test scores. What we can't talk about is uh, the structured use of phones in classes. Like mm -hmm. we, we were only looking at schools that banned phones when they previously didn't have a mobile phone policy and we saw that uh, kids' test scores improved after right. that. Luciano, let's try and look at this a bit deeper, right? And I, and I go back to my own childhood. I'm not that old, but I definitely didn't have a smartphone when I was in school. Yeah. We didn't have the sort of technology. So say like late 80s, early 90s. When I was in class, yes, of course, I was distracted whether it's by my friends or girls or whatever it is, and we'd, we'd send little notes to each other, right? And, you know, roll them up and throw them across and pass them on. The teacher would sometimes intercept it. This is normal, right? You'd accept this is normal. But I guess while I was distracted, everything I was distracted by was within those four walls. That was it. That was my world. Isn't it a little scary that kids these days have access to an entire universe of knowledge and noise as well outside of the classroom that they can have in their hands, on hand, at any given time while you're trying to teach them very basic things like discipline, like concentration. 
You're, you're right, yes. The uh, thing is, um, if we, nowadays we have to be aware they, they can be isolated. When you and me were in the class, mm. we used to socialize, as you said, throwing a piece of papers and chart a bit. Mm. Um, but now there is another problem that if they use the phone in class, sometimes they use it to, to be in another part, not with their classmates. Mm -hmm. And that's a big problem. So they're going into that little world yes. and they're not interacting with people, yes. right? So yes. isn't that a good argument to say, put away the phone so you can look up and look your yes. classmates in the eye and yes. engage talk, with them, yeah. right? Talk to talk. your classmates, talk to your teacher, ask, ask him uh, something, mm -hmm. yeah, just communicate. And they don't, and they don't. Sometimes they don't. Right. Duru, I'm not going to ask you about whether you do this or not, but in a general sense, are people constantly engaging on social media? Are they constantly liking each other's you know, pictures mm -hmm. or commenting or whatever while they are in a classroom setting? Is that happening? Well, it sometimes happens. It's, mm -hmm. It depends on the lesson or mm -hmm. um, it depends on the student. <clears throat> I think it's not always about the restriction or just the teacher telling to uh, put away the phones. Mm -hmm. It's in my school. It's always up to. Um, in, at some point, it's always up to the student, and the student is the one uh, who decides uh, whether he or she will listen to the lesson. And so, uh, for example, if I um, if I say that the lesson is important for me, then I will just not right. look at my phone. And and I don't want to get you in trouble with your friends, but mm -hmm. out of your peers, would you say that? the majority are disciplined or that the majority are addicted to their phones even in a classroom setting? It really depends. I think mm. it depends on the lesson. I, in some lessons, I just don't see anyone using their phones. Mm. And in some lessons, I see everyone um, getting a bit distracted and distracted e mm. easily. L Luciano, so. is, it, is it hard to sort of click them back into gear and bring their attention back when well, it depends. It depends mm -hmm. on what you are doing in, yeah. that, in that moment. It depends on the lesson. For instance, I'm an Italian teacher. Yeah. But when I teach Dante, right. there's no need of discipline or all that. They right. just listen to it. <laughs> and is there a difference between, I guess, the smartphone and maybe the iPad? Do you find that they, they, one can be more useful than, than the other? Well, the iPad is more useful. In our school, they, mm -hmm. uh, when they start school, they have an iPad. Every student has an iPad. Mm -hmm. um, and they can use it to, for books, for instance, or for um, research, uh -huh. or for something that we might use in class. Uh, but I think they, they easily have the access to phones than iPad, because the iPad, right. I can see the iPad if they're using, using it, and they are not allowed to use it in that moment. What would Dante have thought of Instagram? <laughs> Pits of hell, right? Yes. Snapchat, definitely. <laughs> Richard Murphy, a, a big picture. This discussion that we're having, is this just an example of how we're all trying to figure this out? We, we really, we're in uncharted territory with the technology. Technology has advanced so rapidly and we don't quite know what it's doing to us and how it's affecting not only our children, but, but ourselves personally as, as adults. And so we're going to see some countries take a more strict approach, some, some schools, some cities, etc., and others taking a more lax approach. And at some point, we're going we're gonna to find some sort of happy medium or figure this out? Yeah, completely, completely. There, there was a recent OECD report in 2015 that looked at how the structured introduction of technology into mm -hmm. schools did that improve student test scores? And even that found very inconclusive results. So even when the schools themselves are saying, here's an iPad or here's, here's some new uh, technology, student test scores don't necessarily improve. Sometimes they go down. And they found on aggregate no net benefit of technology in the classroom. And so it could just be because teachers or policy designers don't know how to effectively integrate mobile phones into the classroom environment yet. So I think we're just on uh, the beginning of the road of learning about how to use technology, be it phones or iPads, in, uh, in the classroom. Well, if you're a student watching this show on YouTube in class, put away your phone and focus on your lesson. <laughs> but I, I mean, this is a fascinating discussion. I, I thank you all. I've got a wrap, unfortunately. Richard Murphy, uh, Duru Aiguven, and Luciano Meloni, thank you very much for joining us on the newsletter. Thank you.
That was the haka being performed by a high school in New Zealand. It's a war dance from the country's indigenous Maori people. Not so long ago, many feared their culture would soon die out. But now it seems there's a revival. More New Zealanders are embracing the language and in a boost, the government has announced plans for Maori to be taught in every school in the country. A few years ago, less than 4% could speak the language. By 2040, the government hopes it will be closer to 20%. So what's behind this resurgence? Well, to discuss that and more is Ella Henry. She's a senior lecturer in Maori development at the Auckland University of Technology. Ella, good to have you on the Newsmakers. There seems to be a renewal of Maori language in New Zealand. Tell me what's behind it and are you happy about it? Oh, well, I'm very happy because the language was on the threshold of extinction. But really what we're seeing now is the end of 40 years of, uh, of activism on the part of Māori to protect our language. And in recent years, seeing it being embraced by non-Māori people uh, has really been an added bonus. And I guess the language was synonymous with a culture and a way of life that was conquered, right? And help me understand the stigma related to using the language or even just the expression of the culture in the past? Uh, well, obviously, one of the things that the British wanted to do when we signed a treaty with them was assimilate us to make us into good British citizens, which unfortunately we were not terribly good at. We had a, a wee war uh, that did not go well for us. And as a consequence of that, we lost our economic base and alongside that legislation was implemented to help us to assimilate faster and that resulted in the loss of a lot of our cultural characteristics, our language and so it's really been part of a, a huge renaissance of the culture in the last 40 years as uh, Maori people have come to live in the cities, have become more better educated and uh, more assertive about protecting our culture mm -hmm. and, ident and our identity because that's who and what we are. Is this something that, that means different things for Maori people and for white New Zealanders? So, for example, when we see the expression of the culture and we see this becoming more mainstream and it being cool to have uh, an association with Maori culture, is it, is it different things for different peoples? Well, interestingly, uh, uh, we've just had the Maori Language Week in New Zealand and a number of quite prominent non-Maori uh, European New Zealanders have been speaking out about how uh, and knowing the language is actually something that makes them feel more committed to the place as well. Mm. It's something that's different from our neighbours in Australia or Canada or, or the United States where they also have an Indigenous population. And so they are starting to see and feel the benefits of that unique cultural identity uh, which they're a part of when they learn the language. Right. And so you've given us an accurate description of the zeitgeist the fact that there's a lot of positivity related to this. We saw the Prime Minister also have a couple of videos out on YouTube and elsewhere, um, speaking a few sentences. Is this something that needs to be allowed to develop organically within the society, or is it something that the government needs to give a good big push um, at? Well, the... Yes, the government has been required to protect the, the language uh, under the terms of the treaty where they guaranteed the protection of all things that were precious. So there is, you know, a strong government support and this particular government is committed to making the language available uh, as a compulsory subject by 2025. So we are quietly optimistic that what has begun is not just a flash in the pan, but is actually part of a fundamental uh, revitalization of what is it, it means to be a New Zealander. Many New Zealanders call themselves Kiwi. I think that's a relatively mm -hmm. well-known phrase internationally, and that's a Maori word. Yeah, and so it starts with language. Where does it end? Does it end with a more equal society, a less racist society, a society that is truly more representative? One would hope so. Um, I mean, we still have, you know, racism issues in this country, and that is proven consistently. Um, I do think, though, that as a nation, we are wrestling with having a conversation across cultures, which I think is the first step in ameliorating racism. Um, the biggest issue for Māori people, of course, is because we have been in the lowest socioeconomic groups for so many decades, we are more likely to be in jail, more likely to die young, 
So we have a huge job to do to to revitalize our economy and our our economic foundations. But I think culture is such an important part of self belief, mm -hmm. and that is an enormous con contributor to well being. And other countries are also wrestling with similar things, similar parallels, whether it's the United States and Native Americans, whether it's the First Nations in Canada. What, what kind of lesson do you think they can learn from the New Zealand experience? Interestingly, a number of the Canadian, American, Australian and Pacific Island peoples who are also dealing with language revitalization have come and uh, learned from our separate education system, our Maori education system. And they have taken that back as far afield as, uh, you know, the Sápmi people of Norway, um, the, uh, the, the the people of, of the states, as we said, in Canada. So we think that Indigenous people working together have a similar agenda, revitalization of culture and language, rebuilding of economy and building a more stable place for the future and the way we interact with the dominant culture. Okay, very finally, Ella, how do I say pleasure to have met you or pleasure to have spoken with you in Maori language? Well, well, we tend to have a generic phrase. Uh, we're not much for small talk in our language, mm. but we say kia ora, okay. which means be well. And we say it when we meet each other. We say it when we go to yeah, kia ora, be well, be happy. Okay, Ella. Kiora, I hope my pronunciation is half decent. All the best. It was absolutely fabulous. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. That's all for this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. You can check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Remember to like, follow and subscribe. Until next time, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.